Okay, let's get started, everyone. It is now my pleasure to introduce Hillary Brown, our keynote speaker for today. Uh, Hillary is the principal in the New York City firm uh, New Civic Works. She's also a professor at the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York, as well as a fellow of the Post Carbon Institute. And she'll be speaking on future-proofing infrastructure, action items for the Anthropocene. So please join with me in welcoming Hillary Brown. Thank you, Lincoln. I'm really thrilled to be here. I want to thank the conference organizers um, and the sponsors. Um, I just love being in this majestic landscape here. Um, I'm going to begin with an overview, I think, of one of the key challenges that is mentioned in this conference. Um, and we'll talk about today the term anth Anthropocene, um, which is used to describe human how human activities have altered our planet uh, changes that are really the physical equivalent of a new geo-epic. Scientists are now in agreement that hum the human signature is, is writ too large and that um, our imprint is falling outside the lines everywhere. So having crossed certain planetary boundaries with profound land use changes, with freshwater overuse, um, unsafe levels of uh, greenhouse gas emissions really increases the likelihood that we're going to trespass beyond others. So this raises the key question I'll talk about today. How might a gain in our ecological intelligence, and by that I mean not just environmental literacy, but actually the expansion of human ecological agency, how might this improve uh, the performance of human constructed systems? And I want to argue for a paradigm, a new paradigm that might be able to help future-proof urban systems for this new epic. Um, and I, I'm going to try to show you how we might optimize infrastructure systems through new combinations. Um, but let's begin with the context here. Uh, America's infrastructural deficiencies have been well documented um, and we're asking ourselves the question, how can these uh, systems, many of which are at the end of their useful lives, uh, continue to support an, an increasingly urbanizing world, and especially one uh, facing the liabilities of a destabilizing climate? The American Society of Engineers notably gave a D plus to the conditions for adequacy and safety. Um, uh, to America's infrastructure across the boards, and um, I think that what I want to call your attention to is the lower figures, how uh, the U.S., um, which is roughly a third, uh, it, three times the size of Europe, is investing such a small percent um, of its GDP in infrastructure. So that's, that's a real beginning. Um, we have a president who's pushed for greater infrastructure investments multiple times um, since he took office, and here he is uh, at, the, at the Tappan Zee Bridge reconstruction uh, speaking about the infrastructure gap and the imperative for strong investment in new and upgraded systems. Uh, he reminds us, and he, I quote, that's what great nations do. So only a week later, as if to acknowledge our great nations fall from grace, uh, in this regard, Pope Francis, during his New York visit last year, he astounded onlookers by stopping in the middle of an address and went over to this uh, piece of rusty, neglected overpass and blessed it. I thought that was a really amazing moment. So I want to talk about a number of factors that may be causing the current paradigms to change. Um, familiar to many of you, but obviously um, we have the imperative for these assets to begin to mitigate greenhouse gas, gases uh, to reduce our nation's carbon footprint. The rise of what we would say might be a paralyzing nimbyism, the public awareness of the potential, whether real or perceived, of the kinds of encumbrances um, and harms that may be rendered by uh, large project sightings. That, that's made it very difficult for us to um, expand our systems. We have urbanization pressures, which are requiring expansion of facilities. 
Um, and we need to, uh, in so doing, think about um, decentralizing some of this and, and providing a, a, a smarter grid that can accommodate both centralized and decentralized systems. And of course, we have the rising environmental risks that are highlighting the interdependencies among uh, systems and call for adaptable solutions. So uh, meeting these challenges, I argue, we need to have new um, habits of mind, thinking about how these systems are interdependent and networked, and that creates certain opportunities. So whereas conventional improvements in urban infrastructure traditionally is undertaken by separate agencies, different enterprises and authorities, um, as if each were uh, separate and unrelated to the others and to the outer world, um, we realize that the, the world is, the built environment, sorry, is, is a complex collection of inputs. We have fuels, food, materials, water, um, and outputs, uh, CO2, waste, water, waste, heat, pollutants, et cetera. And we need to appreciate the interactions um, among energy and materials and their entropic flows more clearly and find the potential in recovering some of these spent resources for beneficial use by other systems. So the model here, of course, is natural systems, and here's where ecological agency comes in, because these models can help us reconceptualize uh, our infrastructural complexes for more net positive benefits. In, in my book, I, I uh, coined the term infrastructural ecology, uh, which is really about the mutually beneficial transactions across a set of different systems, just like you see here in this forest ecosystem. Um, so the ecosystems provide ecological services uh, upon which we depend, and our infrastructure systems are effectively the extensions of those. Um, so we need to know, you know, we need to revisit that connectedness and mutualism to ensure that we can uh, organize our systems uh, cooperatively and synergistically. So I, I've coined the term infrastructural ecologies um, for what we hope are transformative uh, services provided by power plants, sewage treatment plants, uh, et cetera, when they are thought about or interlinked cooperatively. Um, and I think that um, I, will, I will explain this through a series of case studies, so, but I want to emphasize the opportunity to find the synergies. And this is what has really fascinated me in researching the book and finding all of these examples across the world. So here are the action items. Uh, there are really five principles in the book um, that we can try to uh, reimagine our technical networks. First is the core principle that we have to, as I said, foster integration across different systems um, and co-locate them according to their dependencies and synergies. Uh, we have to um, decarbonize or uh, reduce emissions, not just from power plants, but from the, the water uh, waste treatment from IT and other technologies. We can follow uh, green infrastructure's soft path versus our conventional gray infrastructure hard path in working uh, and aligning our systems with natural processes. Um, the imperative to make community friendly. In other words, how can these systems uh, serve, beneficially serve communities instead of being just eyesores or simply merely mitigating their uh, noxious um, outputs? And then lastly, of course, how do we adapt them to uh, a, a changing uh, climate condition. So those are the five principles. And as I went through the case studies, I, I really called out many of the uh, benefits and savings. I'm not going to uh, identify all of these, but I think one of my leading arguments and is that as, in, as our cities become more congested, we need to uh, stress the effectiveness of, sh of shared real estate. And I think this is a really underemphasized em uh, part of sustainability that affects energy and resource consumption. So we can produce economies of scale with hybridized or co-located complexes and eliminate redundant features um, and even cascade resources from one to the other. Um, and you can see some of the other benefits, not least of which, of course, is uh, community benefits and related job creations, which I'll explain. So here are just two simple examples of a hybridized or multifunctional 
um, systems that I think are colorful. The, the, on the left uh, is the um, a bridge in Amsterdam that has two lanes for pedestrians, trams, bicycles, and cars. Um, and then slung under the, 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 uh, the carriage of the bridge are utilities that serve the adjacent island. We would never do that in this country. On the right, you're looking at a wastewater, or you're not looking at the wastewater treatment plant. You're looking at a beautiful um, world-class conference center, multi, uh, harbor development that sits atop um, and completely uh, encloses a wastewater treatment plant that serves the entire region. Um, and this is a, a feat that was underwritten by the European Union. Um, in another interesting project called the Smart Tunnel, um, in Kuala Lumpur, in order to reduce urban congestion under the center city, a tunnel was built. But at the same time, studies showed that um, it could be designed to, some, to, to also contain monsoonal floodings, which were a major problem in, in downtown. Uh, by closing the tunnel to traffic, accommodating the water on these different stages of the tunnel, um, and then after the, uh, the, the water subsides, uh, returning it to service. So that was a really great example, and it re received a lot of different awards for this. So it's really two services for the price of one. Um, needless to say, multimodal uh, transport centers really fit into this class of assets. And when finished, the, the San Francisco's um, Trans Bay Transit Center is really going to embody this shift away uh, from single mode capital solutions to transmodal and stack solutions uh, and multi tiered mixed use. So, th this five story facility is going to integrate um, 11 different transportation services. It has, it's crowned with this marvelous roof, uh, rooftop public park. Actually, it's in construction. Um, and it, it was really built through a very coordinated effort among Fed, state, local to uh, package the revenues from the, the, um, the new construction of commercial and residential that surround this um, uh, area being rebuilt. So I think that this new kind of compound uh, asset is uh, really an important outcome of collaboration among uh, different uh, planning and operating agencies, which is the key to this anyway. So I think perhaps the best existing example of urban ecologies um, is this um, new town outside of Stockholm, <coughs> Hammerby Schostad, <coughs> which is a compact mixed-use development. But here the city decided uh, in order to reduce its carbon footprint, it took the municipal utilities, brought them together, put them in a room, and said, figure out how we can reduce our carbon footprint. And they actually figured out how they could redistribute re residue or waste from one uh, systems process for productive use by another. For example, uh, the, bio, sorry, the biogas extracted uh, from the sewage plant is processed as fuel, for local vehicles as well as domestic cooking stoves. Heat is recovered from that process water of the wastewater treatment plant for district heating and cooling. We have mixed household waste, which is routed for combustion in the combined heat and power plant, uh, where it's combined with forestry waste, and so on and so forth in this extraordinary closed loop system, which reduced their carbon footprint uh, by roughly 40, uh, 40 to 50 percent. Um, <clears throat> and it has not been really replicated anywhere else. But this other example, I think, is really exemplary and something we could do here at home easily. In the city of Lille, France, uh, they looked across three different municipal services to, to, to uh, create emission reduction solutions by combining transportation, sewage works, and solid waste management. So they did an initial pilot where they took, uh, they fermented the sewage sludge to produce a biogas, um, and they then altered the buses, public buses, to receive the biogas. That worked so well that they then set up a new organic municipal solid waste recovery facility where they separated organic waste, processed it in anaerobic digesters uh, into a clean biogas, and that now serves the entire uh, Leal region. Um, as if that wasn't enough, then they built their uh, bus depots, the, the, the storage of, of buses, the depot system, right there at the fueling, uh, at the, at the uh, 
facility so that they wouldn't um, expend miles to refuel. So their carbon uh, balance was, was cut dramatically. Um, here's a project in Vancouver, I think, uh, which is another example. Um, this provides district heating and cooling um, and uh, domestic hot water by recovering heat, again, from the uh, building's wastewater on its way to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and it moves this waste heat to energy transfer stations that then provide the thermal energy to the mechanical systems of the buildings. And this recovery uh, supports 60% reduction in greenhouse gas. So this is, this is an exemplar. They, they've been doing this in Europe, but this is um, kind of leading the way um, in, in this hemisphere. I love this project because it talks about um, a new use for an old abandoned coal mine in the former mining city of Hirland, Holland, uh, where the two women civil engineers for the town developed this concept of mining the uh, wastewater that fills up the abandoned mines and uses that as a heat source um, and also uh, can send back the, the water as, uh, or, or they can send the water as a heat sink. And they, they, they worked with the old miners to find the wells and to set the system up, and it's an exemplary system. Uh, that cut their carbon emissions by 55%. Um, there are some million, one million mines uh, disused worldwide, and we recently had a study that looked at an Appalachian mine near Pittsburgh that could heat and cool some 20,000 homes. Um, but right now, we take mine water and we discard it. We treat it because it's contaminated, and we discard it. Uh, another example, which I, I think is in the, the uh, permitting process, um, a long abandoned Arizona open pit copper mine. I think you have a few um, active ones around here. Um, and its adjacent waste uh, rock dump site, which is in the lower part of the photograph, is being permitted. And it will host a 100 megawatt uh, solar plant. And um, it will then use a 150 megawatt closed loop pumped storage facility. So think battery. Um, you can see the two levels of these now uh, pr proposed reservoirs, one at the top, one down in the mine pit. And as water flows, uh, during the day, the, the, uh, the solar energy is used to pump the water up. And then they can generate uh, energy on demand uh, to serve peak uses um, by letting it fall and using uh, hydro turbines. And so it really recovers this brownfield to a productive use. And I think that there are many sites, such sites that we can begin to think uh, creatively about. So I now want to talk about the, the sort of the real green infrastructure part briefly. Um, the term soft path really suggests our moving away from fossil fuel and chemical intensive water treatments. And here in Toronto, uh, designers of this um, lakeside urban revitalization made the uh, collection and treatment and conveyance of stormwater the kind of central organizing concept of this beautiful park. And um, you can see the, the um, emerging uh, and then uh, coming down from these uh, as a fountain is the stormwater that's been treated by ultraviolet, so it's made sanitary for uh, human contact. And then it goes through a series of biofiltration treatments on its way to the lake. And it really provides this beautiful feature right in the heart of the park um, and is, um, I, th I think, a real exemplar of, of green, infra green infrastructure. Uh, one uh, in my backyard, actually, is this um, ingenious project that solves a number of problems. Um, New York City had to, uh, had to uh, move away from using the the, the water direct from reservoirs and create a water filtration treatment plant about 10, 15 years ago. And they had the problem of how do they going to locate this tremendous facility, which is like nine acres and uh, nine stories deep. So the designers uh, depressed it into the park. They roofed it with the largest green roof in the world. And they turned that uh, facility back to the community. Um, 
which is a low-income community which had been in arms about uh, the loss of their open space. And it provides a golf uh, driving range and other community facilities. It also kind of exemplifies the hydrological cycle because it recovers and bioremediates stormwater as well as the uh, displaced groundwater. When you put this facility into the ground, you create a lot of wastewater. And rather than going to the city sewers, they pump this water up to the top of the roof. They send it through this uh, series of biofiltration moats that surround the plant and also provide security. And that water is then used to, um, to uh, irrigate the golf course um, and saving some um, 3 million gallons a year. Um, another, I think my favorite project is this multifaceted uh, makeover of, a, um, of Wadi Hanafa in Riyadh, a formerly a polluted and deteriorated seasonal stream that bisects the city, which has very little open space. And in lieu of uh, treating this, what has become an urban sewer, uh, with an expensive water filtration uh, plant, the designers actually re, uh, refashioned the whole length of the river as it flows through the city, uh, widening its zone, laying it out with uh, stone uh, waterfalls, weirs, pools, introducing riffles, and that oxygenates the water and allows microorganisms to process the contaminants. And what you're seeing in this large image is the final step where these individual bioremediation cells, uh, which contain um, uh, tilapia that are feeding on the algae uh, that is produced by the activity of the microbes, um, it, that's the last stop in this process, and the water is now reusable for agriculture in the desert. Before this, the water has simply um, not been usable, salvageable. Um, so now I want to talk about a, a couple of what I call community-friendly systems. Um, I think that this is the imperative of uh, the Anthropocene to start thinking about how do we hybridize these facilities with neighborhoods. This, this facility is less than two miles from the Eiffel Tower, and it is one of a bold new breed of uh, waste-to-energy plants um, that Europe has many of for many reasons that we don't, um, and we should. And the plant uses a number of ameliorative strategies to guarantee local acceptance. Um, they use an environmental charter, um, a local monitoring uh, by, by the neighbors of health and safety, and they use uh, transport of waste on barges instead of truck traffic. But the physical design of the plant was such that they depressed the whole thing, again, uh, into, the, into the ground, reducing its visual um, uh, impact and odor and noise. And um, it, it looks kind of like a, an office building with a green roof you know, if only we could uh, build such facilities. Another in, in series of these is a, um, a, a project in um, Hiroshima, Japan, uh, which undertook to hire J J Japan's most notable architect, Yoshio uh, Taniguchi, to design this new waste energy plant. Um, and he fostered the idea of creating a, a community waterfront park at the edge of this facility. But he makes all of the visitors trespass right through the facility, and he created what he calls his museum of garbage. So you can see that he's got these wonderful glass uh, walls where you can look down and see all of the, the activity of digesting the municipal solid waste. Um, and the otherwise uh, wasted heat of combustion, which most of which goes to uh, heating homes nearby, but the remaining goes to heat a neighboring uh, uh, swimming pool. So th this kind of mutual sharing. Uh, this is a lovely project that um, many architects are, are experimenting with uh, un or unorthodox forms to help disarm the public and gain approval for what would otherwise be contested works. And um, this is one where the architect um, is urging visitors uh, to visit the facility, go to the top, put on a pair of skis, and ski down an artificial snow field. Uh, and Copenhagen, Copenhageners are going to love it because they're in the flatlands. Um, 
And the plant also has this uh, environmentally progressive billboard. So you'll see that when it uh, releases a ton of carbon dioxide, it also releases a smoke ring to signal that. Um, so turning to uh, climate adapted solutions and as climate instability unfolds, uh, we need to withstand hazards to heat stress, severe storms, uh, sea level rise, um, and other meteorological stressors. Um, so how do we incorporate um, this risk analysis and uh, other adaptive strategies? I think the Netherlands, of course, are leading the way for obvious reasons. Um, what you're looking at on the left is the uh, before and after of a series of uh, stormwater parks um, that are encouraged to fill up um, during, uh, during flood seasons uh, when, when uh, rains from Europe come flood into Rotterdam. And then they become you know, water parks. And you can see on the right, the proposal is to, um, to uh, scale this across the city. That's one of the ways they're coping. Um, in another part of the world, this is um, a barrage, a tidal barrage or barrier um, preventing a storm surge in uh, Korea that um, was adapted uh, later to also um, utilize tidal energy. So the tremendous tidal differences in this part of the world, they could generate an energy um, much of the day. And then you can see here they have this incredible um, uh, park they call the Reed uh, Wetland Park. So again, multiple use um, incorporating uh, low carbon strategies. Um, Again, in Korea, uh, where a country afflicted with a very wet season and then a very dry season now has an ordinance uh, citywide in Seoul to require developers and new building owners to capture roof stormwater, um, something we could easily do, uh, clean it, store it, um, and later use it for site washing, uh, fire control in buildings, irrigation, so on and so forth. And this really helps with the, uh, the, use, the use of no, non-potable water here then um, can achieve water balance in the climate that is increasingly stressed by changes. I just found this example in uh, Manicota, Minnesota uh, of a water reclamation facility that treats effluent uh, from its wastewater on the left. Um, and that recovered water is sent to the Manicota, Manicota Energy Power Plant where it meets its cooling needs. And that displaces, of course, the use of fresh water. So this is a project that really addresses head on this whole thing called the energy water nexus, which you may have heard about, namely the increasing, uh, increasingly vulnerable arrangement where water is needed for power plant cooling, for example, while energy is required to uh, treat and distribute water. And so this, this project uses the res this reciprocity to the advantage of both. Um, a, a favorite project I never get tired of talking about, even though it's not built, uh, was in the, the Canary Islands. And it is actually a uh, performing arts venue um, framed by this, this superstructure, which is a, de a solar desalination plant. Um, and th this large armature intercepts the seawater-laden breezes and that air is brought through these solar heated evaporators and then comes in contact with uh, seawater cooled pipes and condenses to fresh water. So it's a really extraordinary project. Um, I'm hoping that some version of this gets built. <clears throat> so now I wanna just talk very briefly, uh, particularly to this audience about how uh, might we begin to implement this. And I think the leadership we, it necessary is probably local leadership. Um, for many reasons, the, fe the federal government has defaulted in visions and leadership, and I think that local leaders are in the best position um, to make future proofing um, possible in the absence of that agenda. So we need to transcend compartmentalized thinking and create these cross-sector strategies and designs uh, for multifunctional public works. I think that um, levels of government uh, are poised, they have more agile leadership uh, to, to lead in this transformational planning. 
And um, you can see examples here of uh, Oklahoma City, which had a, um, a, 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 a issued a bond for its um, uh, cross-sectoral work on parks and streetcars and transit hub. Um, the Chicago Infrastructure Trust, we're, we're still waiting for it to be entirely leveraged off um, pri private and public money, but they have succeeded in uh, relamping street lights across Chicago with LED lights. Famously, the California Infrastructure and Economic Development Bank, which has um, really is a revolving fund that promotes uh, through the way it's structured and the way procurement is done, it has been um, successful in having um, some multi-sector projects uh, accomplished. And then lastly, more recently, the West Coast Infrastructure Exchange um, across Portland, uh, sorry, across Washington, Oregon, uh, California, and British Columbia to work together to develop new cooperative models uh, for infrastructure procurement and management and to deal with some of these projects at a regional scale. So I think that, that those are some good examples. Um, but we also have some time-honored uh, vehicles for financing, which you know, if we figure out how to um, procure the projects correctly, we can use. These are the state revolving funds that have been in place for a long time. Uh, they used to be grants to transit and to water uh, infrastructure, uh, but today they could be a revolving fund that finances a lot of these uh, creative public works. We have state infrastructure banks. Some 33 states have uh, the uh, ability to use these to combine public and private funds. And we have green banks, uh, the Connecticut Clean Energy uh, Authority, which is a, a wonderful example of very, very creative use. But the idea would be to use the, the financing capacity, but to actually do the procurement in a smart way by having the uh, the bank adopts some outcome-oriented uh, principles um, along, uh, that, along the line of what I've talked about today. So that's some retooling that could be done that could prioritize projects that meet some of these key criteria. Um, so they could uh, give extra points to projects that promote combined functions um, and reward that, those projects that are using uh, brown versus green fields. Uh, that encourage uh, joint use of circulation maintenance. Um, but banks and state revolving funds could uh, grant or loan, I should say, to those projects um, that can prove they're reducing carbon footprints through distributed generation um, or recovering waste from another facility's use for, for its generation, um, creating closed loop programs. Um, they can incentivize projects with reduced stormwater footprints. Um, they can place value on those projects that incorporate community benefits. And there probably are a lot more examples out there of these really creative facilities that are doing education, cultural, uh, and, and civic um, activities on the site of, of the infrastructure facility. And then finally, they can ensure that project grants help underwrite climate protection. Um, on critical systems. So um, the other step might be, and we've talked about this, um, I guess it's been talked about at the federal level, creating an infrastructure czar, um, but there are uh, various blue ribbon infrastructure commissions that exist in Massachusetts, New York, um, and some other places where a panel um, could advocate for, uh, and not only advocate, but, but actively uh, negotiate and help enact uh, a multi, a cross-sectoral project and broker this through a process. Um, and they would be responsible for helping to um, blend the state, city, federal funding uh, from across different capital programs that are affected by this. So I'm going to close just by uh, showing a couple of slides. One well, I guess only this one because the other one went away. But um, this is a study I'm working on right now uh, in New York City to look at a, a little infrastructural ecology on a, on a piece of Jamaica Bay. Um, and it combines um, uh, the, um, there's a wastewater treatment plant from which we're going to uh, cap capture un unutilized methane. 
um, and we're going to refuel the city buses at the local, at the nearby MTA uh, facility, like they did in Lille. We're looking at other ways of um, uh, harvesting organic waste, and uh, right now we're talking about creating um, solar uh, uh, sludge digesters that will yield class A biosolids, and those will be right on site, so instead of spending millions of dollars to cart our sludge away, we can turn it right on site into, uh, uh, into uh, fertilizer for local urban agriculture. So I think I'm at the end of my talk here, um, and so I, I'm just going to uh, post the uh, not notice of another book that um, will be out uh, early next year um, that looks at uh, a, a very fertile field, which I feel is a developing nations. Um, and I've similarly looked at case studies, which are using uh, quite um, alternative technologies to solve some of these problems. Um, and I think that we have to look to these developing nations. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, Haiti, where I work, is effectively a tabula rasa. And we can start leapfrogging over some of our legacy systems and putting in place more benign and uh, 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 civically beneficial facilities. So with that, I hope I'm not over time. I'm going to close and thank you. And maybe we have a time, uh, time for a couple of questions. Yes, gentleman in the middle. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm uh, not knowing that projects, you know, particularly well. I think that what um, I try to point out is that in the foreground, in the planning process, uh, the advisability of all of the stakeholders and the actors to reach out uh, to communities, and that's that's exactly Canada has actually taken the lead in this. And what they do is they uh, put. Uh, proposals or put on offer um, the opportunity for a town to um, to bid on taking a, an infrastructural asset and uh, determining what they would like as a consideration, so that there, it eliminates a lot of the oppositional uh, moment in momentum in that in that process. Um, and they have been very successful in doing this on power plants and uh, wastewater treatment plants, I understand. Um, we also have environmental, um, uh, what do we call them? Uh, environmental benefits, which are negotiated um, with communities uh, related to the intrusion of these facilities. But I think that, again, the notion is how do we get across to designers, to planners, landscape architects and architects, the way to design out some of the uh, unfavorable aspects. I mean, mega projects are mega projects, and maybe they need to be dispersed. Um, maybe, uh, although that flies in the face of what I'm talking about, but I think that it's the foreground planning, the upfront work that can prevent um, so much of the discord. I hope that answers your question. We have another uh, question in the back. You'll have to shout because...
Oh, that's a terrific question. Um, so we have been not so successful in many of our legacy systems of anticipating uh, stressors. Um, and the idea, I think, if we apply this idea of infrastructural ecology, say, to um, a, a community that needs to enlarge its uh, power plant or wastewater treatment plant and goes ahead with this model, uh, they will find that by decentralizing or distributing the energy, uh, they can be both on the grid and off the grid. So I think there's huge opportunities if we apply this thinking to new developments, to enhancements of existing facilities, to allow these uh, facilities to, to then you know, switch over from you know, a, a gridded water or energy system. Um, but I, again, I haven't, uh, I haven't really seen examples of this, but I think that you know, latent in this design notion is that resiliency. Um, you know, and nature is, is not the be-all and end-all model, as we know, uh, because we have systems that actually flip um, when they're too highly stressed and they cease to function and need to rebuild themselves. Uh, and we don't want to get there with that. But I think that's a great question. But I, I, I do advocate for the notion of how we can supplement today's infrastructure with these systems that allow for perturbations. Uh, any, any more questions? Okay. Well, I thank you very much. <laughs>